So welcome. We're going to get started. Um, this is our last Ebola forum, we're sad to say. It's been um, such a pleasure working with everyone and all of you in the room, the faculty, um, that have joined us for these discussions. Um, today we're going to talk about where we go from here now that the, fa the forum is ending and what opportunities um, we'll be able to discuss moving forward here at Emory. I, I want to start by thanking my co-chairs, Dr. Cedar Ranshad Nielsen from the Institute of Developing Nations and Dr. Pamela Scully from the Department of African Studies, and um, our um, IDN support staff, uh, Keisha Haywood and um, Judy Phillips, who have done a fantastic job arranging all of these. And uh, those of you who were at the um, um, President uh, Carter Forum last week um, know what a huge effort this has been, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed some of the uh, speakers and um, our receptions. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the schools publicly for their support and resources, including the College Law School, Business, Candler, School of Medicine, School of Nursing, Rollins, um, Laney, Oxford, um, for all of their support. They've been tremendous in um, um, uh, working with us. Um, as I mentioned, um, this faculty forum is going to just be a wrap up talking about where we're going to go from here. We would not, we would hope that this conversation does not end. And you that have been involved throughout the whole process, um, we would like to hear from you of what you would like to see happen as we move forward and what resources might be of benefit in making that happen. So our first speaker today is Dr. Elizabeth Downs. Dr. Downs is an associate professor in the Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing and a family nurse practitioner. She is a fellow of the American Association of Nurse Practitioners and of the Academy of Nurses, of Nurse Educators. Um, in collaboration with Doctors Without Borders um, and MSF the, and the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Downs has initiated the first course in complex humanitarian emergencies for uh, nurses at at Emory University. She has also been involved as a trainer for the CDC 2014 Ebola response and the course Preparing Healthcare Workers to Work in Ebola Treatment Units in Africa, conducted by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the Center for Domestic Preparedness. Um, she has, um, is also known for her work with Atlanta's refugee prop population and the migrant farm workers in rural Georgia, so we welcome Dr. Downs. And just as a reminder, this is all being on video, uh, videotaped. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, hi, and thank you for having me speak today. Um, I'm going to come from the nursing perspective. Um, we at the nursing school in the past year were very fortunate to have already had a course set up on complex humanitarian emergencies. And uh, working with CDC, Holly Williams at CDC, and Doctors Without Borders, we had designed it to look at the role of the nurse in complex humanitarian emergencies. And um, what we had done at that time was we were planning to use the traditional way of looking at complex humanitarian emergencies. But we, we took the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and used it as a model for the students to look at what happens in complex humanitarian emergencies. Because frequently I hear Ebola spoken of as a disease. And for West Africa, it really was the complexity, and I think we began with that, talking about that. It was the at the very beginning of our forum of how the complexity of the issue was what led to the mass outbreak. And so we took various aspects of a complex humanitarian emergency, and the students were able to learn from people returning from the field, immediately upon returning from the field, um, how not just what the nursing perspective is, but also the public health perspective. We also scrambled in the fall to put together a set of slides, really, power, none of which I have here, by the way, um, of PowerPoint slides that faculty could turn to and use as a resource. So no matter what course you were teaching in, you had some resources that were up to date. If it was a clinical course, you could look at what were the clinical nursing implications clinically for managing a patient. If you were look, doing something around policy, if you're teaching a health course on policy, they would then be able to use the slides from the policy aspect. So we tried to make it available to everyone and identify where we were touching the topic of Ebola. So with the complex humanitarian course, and I'd say about five courses accessed that, that slide deck in various ways. And we found that a very um, 
gen it was a very useful way to approach it because everyone comes at this, as we've seen through this series, comes at this issue from a very different perspective. Um, we are also fortunately contacted by the um, funders who were bringing over Fatu Kukula, who is working in our school now, trying to learn nursing from a different perspective, and she was just uh, worked in Dabney's class today on Coursera. But I think what's impacted me the biggest about our work is that I think that sometimes what we do um, and what our product, if you will, our nursing students, our graduates, are who they are in spite of what we do because they come to us so motivated and so interested that they make us rise to the challenge. And I'm fortunate enough to have a speaker here today who just came back last week from Sierra Leone. Emily Hedrick graduated from our program in December and immediately went, she's taking boards tomorrow. Mm -hmm. She just came back from 10 weeks, was it? Working in a maternity hospital in Sierra Leone. We have three other graduates who are there at the time. I think Hunter might be back as well. So two graduates who are still there working. And I wanted her to speak about what did we do that supported, detracted, what worked, what didn't work, what can we do? I think she's better, off, better, better able to say that than I'm I. So do you mind speaking for a little bit? Do we have another microphone or do you want to come up here? Come up here. Yeah, come up here. Come on up, Emily. I also want to add that we also have another graduate, Kim Whitlock, who works in the emergency, worked in the emergency room. She graduated from the emergency room nurse practitioner program as well. So. Hello. Thanks for having me. Um, Elizabeth just invited me about an hour before I came today. So, um, um, but I really wanted to come. I wanted to come last week, but the Demi Carter talk was like 24 hours after I got off the plane and I was really tired. So I missed that one, but I'm happy to be here. Um, and so she asked me to say a few things about what, um, what, you, what you could have done differently. differently or better. Um, what we did well. What worked, yeah, what yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so um, th this is the sort of the line of work that I wanted to get into when I applied to the program um, in the first place. And so I would just say that um, keep supporting these kinds of programs, the nursing school and um, the other departments at Emory are, are fantastic for supporting um, international and global health work. So keep it up. Um, I would say that tangible opportunities and experiences um, oftentimes, you know, I would go to advisors, go to professors and say, this is what I'm interested in doing. What's a good way to get started? And um, I got a lot of, you know, oh, just keep working hard and follow your dreams and follow your heart. And that's really great. But um, what I needed was a job or, or an internship or a connection. And, um, you know, when you're working full time and in school full time, it's hard to meet people that are in the field that you want to be in. And so I would say, you know, tangible opportunities while we're still students um, that can really, um, you know, really connect us to that next step. It's not going to be, oh, wait till you graduate and then get out there and network, like help us start networking now. Um, and then I would say to encourage us to get out of the classroom. Um, the skill set that I developed that was most helpful in, um, in Sierra Leone was, was not necessarily my clinical skill set. Um, I have very little maternity experience mm -hmm. and ended up working in the only uh, Ebola holding center that focused on the care of uh, pregnant and postpartum women. So I have 10 weeks more maternity experience now than I <laughs> did before. Um, so that, you know, the skills that I had were not clinical skills, but they were skills that I developed working outside of the classroom, working as part of a team, working with people who weren't nurses, working with people beyond my field. Um, you did the global health experience. I did, yeah. The, uh, the, I spent uh, three months in Madagascar on a, a Global Health Institute project. Multi the only human health focused person, the only nurse on a team that um, with, with GHI, that that was wonderfully, wonderfully beneficial. So opportunities that support that interdisciplinary approach um, and that teach us that it's not about us. It's not about test grades. It's not about, I mean, it is about clinical performance to an extent. But um, for the most part, you know, the success in these kinds of settings um, have a lot more to do with uh, the sort of the, the strength of character and the ability to work as part of a, a strong team. Um, and other than that, um, keep doing what you're doing. 
And if you, anybody has any more questions, or if you have any more questions, let me know. I just, um, how did you find resources there? And how did I find them? Yeah, I mean, was was it well resourced? Um, you know, uh, by the t so I arrived in mid January. So I graduated in December, um, and left uh, mid January. With partners in health, and at that stage in the epidemic, there were basic resources enough to keep us safe, um, and we didn't have supply chain issues in terms of basic medicines, fluids, basic clinical supplies. Um, but, and I, you know, at no point did I feel like the the lack of resources compromised my safety at all, um, which is number one. But uh, we didn't we didn't have a lot to work with. I think particularly in terms of maternity care um there what there we didn't we didn't have a doppler we didn't have an ultrasound we had um we did have blood pressure cuffs which most ebola units don't have so that was exciting <laughs> could you just say something um a little bit more about the teams i really appreciated your comment that most of the skills were not so much clinical, but as learning how to work with teams. Sure. So, um, so I worked in the holding unit for you know twelve-hour days, and mostly had I would take you know two to three trips into the red zone every day. Um, so at the end of the day, you get two to three hours of direct patient care, and the other ten hours is doing everything else. Um, and so, and our unit had between two and five expat staff uh, working on a team of about thirty to forty national staff. Um, and so, you know, it's the everything else that you're really there to do. Um, and, and so the ability to just sort of like take initiative and see what needs to be done and do it, even if it includes like stocking or, you know, like running out and getting stuff off the street, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and being able to, to work, it's, uh, you know, the, we always said that the letters behind your name just erased once you got there. And it really didn't matter if you were a physician or a nurse or a nurse practitioner or a midwife. I mean, it mattered in terms of where you went for your knowledge. But in terms of the, the work that we did, it was, it was all the same. And respecting the, the incredible skill and the incredible performance of the national staff as well. We were not there to tell them what to do. Um, in fact, they were there to ask us, you know, please help us with this. And, and so that was, and that's particularly what drew me to Partners in Health is, as well. That's their model and has been for 30 years. And so they have been, done that very well so far in Sierra Leone. And um, they're going to be there for a, a long time. So another thing that um, happened was another student who went over went in the middle of her, she's a midwife, family nurse practitioner student, and she went over over Christmas between semesters. So working with a partner there, I was able to arrange for her to get about 90 infectious disease hours. Rather than having her to have to come back, she had to, we couldn't put her in maternity right off the plane. That you know We really want to honor that those 21 days. And she wasn't quarantined, but nor could she really go into another partner's clinical site. We didn't feel comfortable asking her to go deliver babies. So within the, we were able to make up those, the time that she couldn't do in our clinical sites by working with partners who were there to allow her to get the infectious disease hours there. And as Emily said, she also wrote me while she was there that she was really good for that quality improvement class that she really was frustrated about having to take because it was looking at quality improvement. And another colleague who's there now is talking about contact tracing and really drawing on the aspects that she got from working with public health students. So that's kind of my point is that we, it's hard to prepare students. We do what we do in spite of the amazing people that come to our school and I'm just really proud. And Emily, by the way, I just found out today, you graduated with Jason. You're in the same graduating class as Jason who worked with Dr. Ribner in the, in the unit. So I'm really proud of our graduates, I have to say. But thanks for the chance to talk. Thank you. So. We're going to hold questions for the rest of the panel um, until the end. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Bill Ely, who is, um, has been in the Department of Epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health since its founding in 1990. His research interests have focused in differences in survival between African American and Caucasian women diagnosed with breast cancer, approaching this problem via population studies. He continues to practice oncology at the Winship Cancer Institute um, and at Grady Memorial. In 2004, he was appointed the Executive Associate Dean for Medical Education and Student Affairs, and in 2013 was additionally named Executive Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education and Continuing Medical Education at the Emory School of Medicine. Welcome. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I just, I'd like to give a few comments and, uh, about what it's been like to be at Emory for a long time and, and go through, not my first epidemic, I will say. Um, and in fact, historically, I remember being at Emory College in around 1978 when, the, um, when Legionnaire's disease was first discovered. And I'm bringing this up because there was fear on the campus that these bugs were coming to the CDC. I remember talking about it with people on the hall. Um, Little did I know that a few years later, I'd be a medical student here and the HIV epidemic would come to be. And there was, if, if you were here then, um, you remember that our society responded to the HIV epidemic, like I would later learn from Peter Brown in medical anthropology, like societies respond to epidemics. They shun, they blame, and they ostracize. And when we started up on this Ebola epidemic, I think we all remember that the first patient coming here was not greeted with kindness or acceptance by many people in our society. There's still great fear, and there always is, but I think it's always um, interesting to look at the past and how that teaches us about the future. So one thing I'd like to say from the beginning, and I, I ate lunch with one of my associate deans today, and we agreed, this was a shining hour for Emory University to let our altruism, if you will, our knowledge and our teamwork and our, um, and our altruism overcome our fear. Because we really did that. Um, how did we respond to this? I will tell you, when I was in medical school, there was no meeting where we invited all the students to come and talk about the HIV epidemic. It was really go in and do your work um, with actually probably a degree of uh, a lack of training and a lack of thoughtfulness that, that thankfully we overcame um, with Ebola. But we did, so this time we called students from the nursing school and the medical school <coughs> already knowing that we were going to prohibit them from taking part in the care to a day where, and I'll tell you one of the most successful things we've already talked about, teamwork. Susan Grant, the chief nursing officer at Emory Healthcare, started off that forum. And I, I've been reflecting on this. That was the first time our medical students have been addressed by a nurse in a classroom. That's important to me. Um, I also know that the the physicians from the team that came over and the nurses displayed all sorts of humility and all sorts of gratitude to the other members of their team. So if you want to, if, if you want to hear messages that come out again, you've heard teamwork several times and you've heard people saying they weren't there to be the teachers necessarily, but I think what Ebola demonstrated for us were some of the wonderful things about what it means to give care. And I'll spend just a couple of minutes on that. First of all, knowledge. We literally have world experts in this virus that thankfully because of our, I think because of our conjunction with CDC, but also because of our fantastic infectious disease um, division at Emory University. And knowledge, the, which we actually, I think, if you look at the New England Journal and other journals, we continue to, to let that knowledge be known across the world. That knowledge did an enormous amount for the patients we came to serve. Very powerful stuff, the knowledge we have in 2015. The next thing I want to go back to is the collegiality. And I think the collegiality between different schools, if you will, between different caregivers, 
the message here was loud and clear to everyone who would hear it that that was essential to success. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and, and I, I will tell you, we had this, this town hall and talked to the students, and that was a great thing, but I'm, I'm not dense enough to think that the media actually trumped any town hall we could have. And I, I remember the media about seeing our patients with their caregivers and all over the world on TV. And the message that came through there loud and clear was that you had some patients who were really grateful, but you also had caregivers who had overcome their fear and not because of money or anything else, because of knowledge, training, and altruism. And the, the, if you will, the compassion they got back from the patients and the looks on their faces, the tears in their eyes, was probably the greatest lesson that Ebola taught our caregivers. And that is those relationships matter, the knowledge matters, and the colleagues are critical to success. And I couldn't have taught a better lesson to our students if I'd kept them in class all together for the next 50 years. Um, rather, a few patients and an outstanding team taught us, I think, enormous value of caring, knowledge, and collegiality. And I think those are things, going forward, if we don't capitalize on that, um, I always, I, I'm especially prone to say this, that people don't learn what we tell them in classrooms. Mm -hmm. They learn what we live, every day giving care. And this was an example of incredible care. So that in and of itself is the lesson. But again, we can take that back to our curricula. Mm -hmm. We can do more things together, and we should. And, but we should also should create the care models that emulates such excellence. So I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. David Stevens. Dr. David Stevens is the Vice President of Research in the Robert Woodruff Health Sciences Center, a position in which he oversees the um, Health Sciences Center research enterprise and leads planning activities that enhance research programs and collaborations throughout the Health Sciences Center and Emory University. He is also the Chair of the Department of Medicine and Chief of Medicine, Emory Healthcare. He is the David W. Schwartzman Distinguished Professor of Medicine, and Dr. Stevens has led the development of successful programs in infectious disease pertinent to us today and microbial pathogenesis, and has been a major contributor to the creation and development of the NIH-funded Emory Vaccine Center. Lots of good things going on there we'll get to hear about. Um, and the Emory Center for AIDS Research. He is Principal Investigator for Atlanta's Clinical and Translational Science Award, which is the CTSA, a multi-institutional research and clinical trials partnership funded since 2007 and refunded in 2012 by the NIH. He has contributed to more than 240 publications, infectious disease and molecular pathogenesis and epidemiology and immunology. Welcome. So good afternoon. Uh, this has been quite an event for, for all of us. Uh, I see Bruce uh, in the room and uh, in the audience, and certainly uh, I think uh, wearing my infectious disease hat, uh, there's been nothing uh, more uh, rewarding uh, and, uh, and challenging in, in some respects than this, uh, this particular uh, series of events. What I want to do, though, is focus this afternoon on the kind of on the research agenda. Uh, we are, I assume I can go forward, uh, great. Uh, uh, we are obviously a university in which research is one of our important missions. And I think in terms of moving forward the subject for today that we should focus on what we are doing and what we can continue to do, especially in the research arena. So I, I think uh, this is my, uh, uh, my slide about uh, the foundation of Emory's Ebola response. It really wasn't possible to say yes uh, to those individuals without the background that, uh, that this slide articulates. 
we have a lot of strengths in basic science and in infectious diseases and discovery, pathogenesis, epidemiology, immunology, and drug discovery. Uh, we have a fine vaccine program uh, that we've been developing for a number of years. We have a strong, long-standing relationship with the CDC in terms of public health programs and in the area of global health. We have worked for a number of years, uh, and Bruce is a great example, for our developing our quality initiatives, our transformation and in, in delivery of, of care in clinical infectious diseases, hospital epidemiology, transportation, transplantation medicine. We had a number of grants between 2002 and 2014 that dealt with uh, biodefense agent preparedness and obviously the creation of the special containment unit uh, shortly after the uh, uh, shortly after 9/11 and the anthrax attacks, and all of those were really preparatory in terms of our ability uh, to respond to Ebola. So, I, in terms of the research new knowledge agenda, I've divided it into uh, these uh, six areas. First is optimal clinical care, optimal clinical management, research, and and uh, new knowledge in this particular uh, arena. We're also very engaged in work in viral pathogenesis and immune responses in Ebola. Uh, there are uh, efforts in investigational drugs, the safety of these drugs, the risk and benefit issues, important issues around immune therapy. We've been involved with investigational vaccines and vaccine trials. The importance, uh, in my view, a very important area is in this interface between biosafety and infection control as it, as it relates to the ability to safely care for these individuals. And as we've heard briefly today, there are a number of protocols, Emory protocols, and also global support. Emory has published 25 publications, peer-reviewed publications, since August on Ebola. Again, a tribute to the, to the team and to the efforts that have, uh, that have occurred in terms of generating new knowledge. I won't go into all of these areas in depth. Optimal clinical management was an issue. Bruce uh, helped lead the way in terms of defining what is optimal clinical management and getting the information out there about optimal clinical management in terms of a number of presentations and also a publication, a hallmark publication in the New England Journal of Medicine that, that came out in November of 2014. Other areas such as uh, rapid testing, radiological imaging, and bedside ultrasound have also been a part of our effort to define optimal clinical management uh, for patients with Ebola. Even articles that publish uh, new technology or technologies that were applied in terms of care of these patients, such as kidney dialysis. So optimal clinical management and new, uh, uh, new evidence that has been widely distributed, distributed in this area is one important area of our research program. In addition, pathogenesis and immune responses, uh, a lot of work, again, by Bruce and the team on levels of iremia, tracking immune responses, uh, a recent uh, funded DARPA grant, uh, actually one of the fastest grants that I've seen uh, go through our system and get funded was, uh, was made available in about a month's time, uh, in, in, which seems somewhat impossible. Rafia Med, Anish Mehta have helped lead that particular effort. Uh, Dick Compans has had a long effort at Emory in, in, in glycobiology and studying glycobiology. Um, I can't uh, overemphasize the role of, of Dr. McElroy and her connection with the CDC in terms of the engagement and, and involvement and her, her work uh, closely related, uh, closely links our efforts with CDC. And then Tom Gillespie's work on the ecology and emergence of Ebola and other viral diseases as examples of work in pathogenesis and immune responses. We've also been quite engaged in optimizing immune therapy in terms of monoclonal antibodies, what antibodies to use, the whole story of, of ZMAP and how ZMAP uh, can and should be used in these patients. There's also a convalescent serum bank that's been created now for uh, for recover from recovered patients. And two important article, or an important article that appeared in PNAS uh, last month, talking about the human Ebola infection and immune activation in these individuals that was highly publicized and noted in, in nature. 
I won't go through this list of investigational drugs, but there's been a lot of effort and continues to be a lot of effort in what investigational drugs and what drugs uh, may be best, including uh, some efforts from our drug discovery program at Emory. Again, an area of research that is continuing and is important. In terms of investigational vaccines, Emory is also helping to lead uh, the way in this particular area. Uh, last month also, uh, Mark Mulligan and his colleagues who have been conducting Ebola vaccines uh, trials now for some time published this uh, article about the Canadian vaccine uh, and uh, its uh, use under an Emory uh, IND that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Society, uh, uh, it appeared in JAMA. We're also involved in other uh, vaccine uh, trials uh, uh, of which are, are listed here. Uh, Dick Compens, as I mentioned earlier, has also been quite interested in Ebola vaccines for some time, and we were a consultant on the CDC's uh, effort to uh, implementation of their vaccine trial that's ongoing now in, in Sierra Leone. Uh, some of this has been alluded to and mentioned, certainly the dissemination uh, again to the Ebola team and to the entire team in terms of dissemination of the protocols for biosafety and, and just clinical care that are available on the website. Uh, uh, thousands of individuals have accessed these, uh, these protocols, which has been, I think, a remarkable uh, distribu uh, a distribution of information that was available from, uh, from Emory. Carlos Del Rio published an article shortly after the outbreak began on, on, on the evolving outbreak last uh, August. We're involved in a number of CDC, both uh, training and uh, training programs. Uh, Bruce is helping to uh, lead some of those efforts. Uh, and again, uh, as we've talked, a number of, of, of stories about uh, how we've engaged in, in volunteerism, in, in fundraising, in, uh, in, for example, modeling control. And he mentioned earlier the uh, complex humanitarian uh, issues that, that nursing has been uh, engaged with. So I, 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 I think one way of phrasing this is kind of crossing the Ebola, if you will. The Ebola, as many of you know, is a river uh, that in, uh, in Zaire that uh, was at the site of the first outbreak in 1976. Uh, like the Rubicon, maybe we are crossing the Ebola in terms of our, our uh, ability as an institution to recognize this very complex uh, humanitarian uh, disaster. It's in my view, uh, important that we continue the momentum forward in terms of thinking about uh, research and thinking about new knowledge that we can continue to distribute or, or, or to disseminate as a uh, university with research as its mission. Uh, and certainly uh, that's an area of, of concern to me and, and things we will continue to drive forward. So I thank you for the, your, your attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Philip Wainwright. He is the Vice Provost for Global Strategies and Initiatives and Director of the HALO Institute, which I always say Holly, and he's trying to help me um, pronounce it correctly, Institute for Global Learning at Emory. He is leading the implementation of the university's new set of global strategies announced earlier this year. So the timing of this, I think, is perfect to talk about Emory, uh, the Ebola's work globally in the context of Emory's um, new strategic plan. Dr. Wainwright began his career in international education almost two decades ago as a study abroad coordinator for Emory's Center for International Programs Abroad. He went on to become Associate Dean for International and Summer Programs at Emory College of Arts and Sciences, overseeing the CIPA, Emory College Summer School, and Emory Pre-College Program, and the Emory College Language Center. Welcome. Thank you very much. I think I have slides. I don't know. Maybe not. One more? Yeah. Good. Um, so anyway, first of all, let me just say that I'm, uh, I, I'm very humbled to be on a panel uh, with so many people who have done uh, so much in regard to the, uh, to the recent uh, Ebola epidemic and Emory's response to it. When B Bill Ely says that uh, this is a shining moment for Emory, I, I couldn't agree more in that uh, I think we can all be proud. And I think there are things about Emory that have led us to this place. Uh, that are not 
true of every institution uh, in the United States. So I think there's a, a lot that we can learn from this experience. Uh, and my particular angle on it is that uh, two years ago, just about two years ago when I uh, became the Vice Provost for International Affairs, uh, the first charge I had was to develop new uh, strategies for Emory. And uh, just to tell you a little bit of the story, uh, the previous time Emory had developed international strategies was in the, in the overall institutional planning effort for 2004-2005. So it had been uh, 10 years since there had been a concerted effort to, to, to look at uh, Emory's amb ambitions internationally and globally. And so uh, the first thing we did was pull together a broadly representative task force, and we had a lot, as any of you who've served on these sorts of committees and task forces, we had a lot of great discussions uh, about what Emory should be doing, what kind of values Emory should embody, uh, and, and how to uh, structure Emory so that in the future we can maximize our, our, our impact. And all of this with reference to uh, Emory's vision statement uh, and, and, and the other uh, quite lofty statements that are uh, part of the, the, the Emory uh, rhetoric. Um, so uh, what I want to do is uh, sort of give you a little bit of the background of where we thought we were going with that and then uh, just uh, sort of introduce uh, e e Ebola into that, right? Because what happened was that we started this two years ago, this plot process, and these processes go on for a long time. But uh, in August of 2014, uh, when the first uh, patient to be treated with Ebola came to Emory Hospital, it gave us another opportunity to really look at what we had been discussing with greater urgency uh, and in greater specificity. So first of all, uh, we, I, what I want to reflect on are really a couple of things. What were the preconditions for Emory's effective response? Because if we're going to, in fact, put in place strategies for the institution that maximize Emory's impact, this is one of the success stories for Emory. What was it about the situation at Emory that enabled Emory to respond effectively? Uh, and, the, and then uh, there also, what are the lessons that we can draw beyond that uh, for, for Emory's global strategy, both as part of kind of the preconditions and, and, and then beyond that? Uh, so the preconditions for response, these are three categories that we had looked at broadly for Emory's strategies, but also which, uh, for those of you who've come to the other presentations from, of the Ebola Forum or, or even just listened to the panelists today, you know, that there was a complex uh, kind of web of, of capabilities and connections that Emory had in place that enabled it to be successful. We had the infrastructure here in Atlanta. Uh, we had uh, expertise, uh, research expertise, clinical expertise, and we also had strong local relationships, uh, very notably the, 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 the uh, CDC. Uh, this is one of the themes that our strategy explores, that we have local entities that have global networks. Um, also, uh, just to give you a sense of how uh, sort of global Emory has become, uh, one, one of the uh, things that, that uh, I think about with the Ebola uh, response is how does this translate to other things that Emory might do? Well, this list uh, on this slide gives you a sense of the, the range of things, uh, and these are mostly health examples, but they don't have to be, the range of international projects and areas of strengths that Emory has around the world. Uh, so you can just tell it's not really bounded by geography uh, or, or, or disciplinary area. Emory has a tremendous amount going on uh, globally. Another uh, statistic, this is taken from the Web of Science from 2002 to 2013, you can see the growth in Emory faculty publications that have at least one international co-author uh, on, on the publication. So what we have seen in Emory, Emory was, was quite international uh, uh, 10 years ago, but there's just been a tremendous increase uh, in, in the international uh, profile of Emory and also uh, the networks of our faculty uh, and the institutional networks. To narrow that down a little bit, here are the example, examples of the kinds of engagement that Emory has had in West Africa. In particular, Emory has had very strong ties to Liberia. 
uh, across a range of disciplines, across the schools of Emory University. Uh, and these go back at least until the early 1990s. Uh, I'm not really going to go into what Emory's contribution was. You've heard a lot about that, and, and, and there, there's a lot of expertise si sitting at the table. But Emory's contribution to Ebola relief uh, has spanned a lot of different areas, uh, from, from clinical care to research, uh, to the tra training of healthcare workers, to having its personnel go uh, to West Africa to, 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 uh, to help. Um, what lessons can we learn from Emory's, Ebola experience, uh, Emory's experience with Ebola? Well, the first thing I would say is that Emory's leadership role was possible because of long-term vision, commitment, and investment. The, th the things that Emory was able to do couldn't have been invented overnight. We couldn't have decided six months ago that we were going to do the things that we've been able to do. Uh, and though that, uh, those resources were put in place not necessarily with Ebola specifically in mind, uh, but for all kinds of other reasons as well, uh, and, and could equally well be used in other settings, other circumstances. Also, Emory's strength in research and clinical care in Atlanta are the foundation for its global, uh, its global health activities. So uh, in, in my line of work, when we're thinking about global strategy, uh, international projects, we're thinking about what goes on overseas, in fact, all of those activities need to be rooted here at home and in the excellence and the, the, the areas of strengths that we have here. Then also, uh, and this was borne out very much in the, uh, reaffirmed the discussions that we had had in the planning process, uh, globally connected partners enable success, whether these are local partners like the CDC or their partners on site overseas. Uh, without those partners, Emory's reach is much shorter than it would otherwise be. Uh, the fact that we can turn to the CDC or the Carter Center, uh, sometimes organizations that are uh, not necessarily experts in the content but have the, the, the area expertise and the expertise on the ground, uh, is a huge asset uh, and, and, and enables Emory to do things. And then also, this is probably what I'm most proud of, is that Emory's values uh, drive its, its, its positive engagement. And I think the institution has been articulating those values, uh, certainly in my time at Emory, uh, values about uh, commitment to doing uh, broader good and to serving humanity. And I think in this case, we really held true to those. Uh, and I don't think that every institution would have acted in quite the same way uh, that Emory did. Uh, and then also one of the things that we discussed a great deal in the, in the, in the planning task force was uh, really trying to focus on addressing problems of global importance. And here, in the middle of the planning process, uh, we had a real live example of Emory really doing something exceptional uh, that, that proved that Emory, in fact, does have that, that vision. Uh, so I think uh, I'm going to stop there. I have a couple more slides, but I think I've said enough at this point. And uh, if somebody's picking this up, they can uh, just skip the next couple. Maybe I should go through to the blank. There. All right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is one of our co-chairs for this event, Dr. Cedar Ranshad Nielsen, who is the director of Emory's Institute of Developing Nations. The IDN works with peace and health programs at the Carter Center and academic programs at Emory University to find new ways for higher education to help solve the world's most complex development problems and I think Ebola certainly qualifies. Um, as director of IDN, she has led, led efforts to promote partnerships among academics development practitioners and policymakers that support sustainable change and improve learning in areas such as gender-based violence and rule of law in post-conflict contexts, peace building in Sudan and South Sudan, and the eradication of neglected tropical diseases. Prior to joining IDN, Dr. Ranshad Nelson was a tenured faculty member at Denison University where she established and directed the International Studies Program. Her research interests focus on gender politics in Sub-Saharan Africa, and she is co-editor of Women, States, and Nationalism at, the home, at Home in the Nation. Welcome. Good 
Thank you so much. Um, and I guess I want to say a couple things at the outset. Um, the first is I want to kind of go on record as saying what a pleasure it has been to work with my co-organizers on this series. Um, we have spent a lot of time together uh, over the course, uh, actually since last fall, uh, putting this together. And it, uh, it has been very exciting and a true joy to um, be working uh, with them to pull together some of the many threads uh, that are connected to Ebola uh, here at Emory and uh, Emory's uh, terrific response to this um, global situation. What I thought I would do today is to share with you just some um, observations and insights um, from the small group discussion that uh, took place in conjunction with the Ebola Forum. Um, in addition to the public events like this one, uh, there was also a competitive process to choose a small group uh, of faculty and uh, professionals um, from different fields and different organizations. We had 23 faculty who were part of this group. We also had uh, a colleague uh, from the Carter Center and a colleague from the CDC, from the Museum of the CDC. And we met uh, four times over the course of the semester um, in conjunction with the public events to talk about our, our reactions to the events and, and share information. Everybody in this group is doing work related to Ebola in some way, shape, or form. It was an incredibly diverse group with colleagues from English, history, anthropology, law, nursing, medicine, public health, um, in addition to our colleagues from some of our partner organizations. Um, so just a few observations that I would like to, to share with you from that. Um, first of all, I think everybody in this group, there was a lot of wonderful energy in this group. You know, when, you, when you're bringing people together from such disparate fields, I think there's always this, I've done a lot of interdisciplinary work and work across professional sectors. There's always this moment where you have this fear about, are people going to have anything to talk about? This could be a very silent discussion group. That was not the case at all. Um, I think that uh, everybody in the group really appreciated the opportunity to talk across disciplines and professional fields um, in which we all work. And I think uh, one of the observations that I take away is that we need more opportunities for this kind of engagement. Um, and that, in, that is, involves more than making the time and the opportunity. I think it also involves creating the structures and mechanisms that will make this happen. Um, I want to echo the shout out to IDN's uh, staff, which did a lot of the organizational work for the forum. Um, Judy Phillip and Keisha Haywood. Um, we also had uh, four fantastic students from the Masters in Development program interning with us um, who have done a lot of support. I see some of them here today, Lauren uh, and Sarah, oh, and Wynette, and uh, Johanna couldn't be here today, but they have done terrific work, not only organizing, but they've been taking notes and, and helping us track all this. So it does take a lot of work. Um, and I think we need more opportunities to do work like this. I'd like to share just a few themes that came up in the discussion group, and they may be variations on a theme um, that, that may have to do with kind of who was sitting in the group or my own particular lens as I look over the notes uh, from, from uh, the semester. The first is that it is not useful to approach public health and religion, whether you see religion as, as uh, uh, an indicator of culture or part of a broader understanding of culture, it is not useful to, to approach these as two separate categories. Even though our institutional frameworks kind of put us in a position of approaching them as two separate categories. As, um, one of, one of the things I, I took from the notes of the session where we addressed religion and public health uh, was a quote from a colleague who said, too often the world, world of public health gets characterized as high science 
and those outside that world question what kinds of mechanisms and resources exist to address context-specific cultural understandings of disease, bodies, death, and the crucial issue of trust. Now, on a related point, one set of issues that came up consistently in discussions around capacity building, training, and disease surveillance and monitoring involved how to balance issues that have both scientific basis and, and apparatus, um, uh, bureaucratic apparatus associated with them, with the need to understand the context-specific nuanced paradigms through which people live their everyday lives. Um, this came out uh, often um, in connection with the Carter Center's work, um, in, particularly, in particular because we were very happy to have Tom Crick, um, who is Associate Director of the Carter Center's uh, Conflict Resolution Program and has worked in Liberia on the Access to Justice uh, Project for a long time, um, uh, with us on a regular basis, and he shared the Carter Center's work. So I guess I would like to point out that in addition to Emory's um, many strengths in terms of teaching, patient care, and research, I think one of the strengths that, that uh, certainly um, was part of understanding Ebola and responding to Ebola is our institutional partnerships, um, particularly with the Carter Center um, and also with organizations like the CDC and the International Association of National Public Health Institutes. Um, the third observation, I guess, that I would offer is that everybody in the discussion group, I think, is most concerned about the critical issue of preparedness for future pandemics. This involves strengthening public health systems, workforce development, vaccine development, and improving national and international response. It also involves addressing critical issues around trust through improved governance, improved social services, and new ways of conceptualizing the relationships between local and global partners. Um, I'm really pleased to say that, that I think part of what makes Emory such an exciting place to do this work is that we have um, amazing people here who are working on these issues and working in deep and long-standing partnerships uh, with colleagues in West Africa, the affected regions, and around the world. So toward the, end, uh, toward the end of working towards preparedness, I guess I just want to pull out one more thing, and that's not from the discussion groups per se, but it's to reiterate a suggestion that was made by President Carter when he spoke to the forum last week. And that is that Emory offer basic training on public health emergency response to ministers of health and their <coughs> staffs during periods of short courses uh, either here or in the region. And I'm confident that with the expertise we have here, um, that is certainly something that can be put into place very quickly, and uh, IDN would be happy to work on that. Thank you. And our last speaker before we open this up for discussion is Dr. Pamela Scully, also one of our um, co-chairs of this um, Ebola Forum. She is Assistant Vice Provost for Academic Innovation, Director of the Center for Faculty Development and Excellence, and Professor of African Studies in Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Um, Dr. Scully is a historian whose research focuses on comparative women's history, with a recent emphasis on biography and on sexual violence in war and post-conflict. She is completing a short biography of Ellen Johnson Sreleaf, President of Liberia. Welcome. Thank you so much, and I echo the gratitude and joy expressed by my colleagues as being part of this forum. It's really been one of the nicest experiences of my career, actually, at Emory. Um, so um, 
what I want to talk about is, is I will, I guess, would echo some of the uh, statements that have been said here, but in part from my um, position of being a, a non-medical person, of being a, someone in the humanities. Um, and I do think what Emery, as my colleagues have said, what Emery does is do interdisciplinarity really well. Um, and it is about teamwork, about being willing to think outside the box. And I think what the power of, of interdisciplinary scholarship and conversation and teaching is that really it, it opens up whole worlds of creativity. You know, more, more people thinking together in, in multiple ways just creates synergies and energy that I think um, provides a kind of multiplier effect of what we can do for the world. Um, and I think this panel exemplifies that. Um, so just to think about how we can think about Ebola, um, which echoes some of what Sita was saying, about Ebola as a disease. It's clearly a disease, and we've heard experts uh, in the health sciences talk about uh, this, um, and about the public publications that Emory has put out um, in, in the various health sciences. Um, Ebola is also about uh, political economy, as Elizabeth Downs was talking about, uh, some of the issues of inequality, the legacies of war, long durée of colonial histories and post-colonial legacies also help create the complexities that Elizabeth was talking about. Um, and then we can also think about Ebola as a gendered disease, um, both as a gendered disease in terms of how it's experienced and also the kind of legacies of Ebola, which is not to say that's the only thing we can say about Ebola, but thinking about Ebola as a, a gendered disease also opens up different ways of thinking about both um, its uh, duration as a disease and what we should do in the future. So um, uh, I am in women, gender and sexuality studies and I'm a historian of uh, gender, I guess, and comparative women's history. Um, and one of the things I've written about and others have too is how we can think about Ebola as particularly experienced by women, as affecting women in particular ways because uh, in, in many places in the world, including in the Ebola affected regions, women are the caregivers. And so since the bodies of the dying and the dead were so incredibly infectious, um, people most likely to, to in, get infected by Ebola would be the people looking after the, the sick and then the dying and then the dead bodies, which would be women. Um, so we can, you know, what does that mean if we, if we start thinking about the, the experience of Ebola, thinking about how it affected women in particular ways would be, you know, it's an, an interesting research study, let alone a sort of compassionate understanding. Um, and then also, if we, if we think about the legacies of Ebola, um, in terms of leaving so many orphans in these uh, countries in West Africa, um, I do a bit of research on gender-based violence in Liberia, and what we know uh, in Liberia is that uh, gender-based violence and rape is quite widespread, as it is in many places. Um, and one of the uh, issues of gender-based violence, sexual assault, rape, uh, in Liberia is that it, girls under the age of 18, and particularly girls under the age of 12, are, are very, very um, vulnerable to sexual violence. So one way of thinking about the legacies or the impact of Ebola in the long term on these communities is if girls already are particularly vulnerable to rape, what does this mean for all the, the young orphans, girls, who now no longer have parents, um, who, are, who are literally going to be doubly vulnerable to rape. So I would imagine that one of the things we should be really concerned about is uh, increasing um, rates of sexual violence, increasing vulnerability of girls. And you know, as researchers, I think we need to think about this more clearly. Okay, I have to just get to my notes again. The phone went off. Um, Uh, so that is one way of thinking about Ebola as more than a disease. And increasingly, this is how um, international organizations are coming to think about it. And I think, um, not totally modeled by Emory, but I do think Emory has modeled that kind of interdisciplinarity. So for example, there are emerging organizations at the international level that are bringing together social scientists, particularly anthropologists, together with people in the health sciences. So the uh, AAA, the American Anthropological Association brought together anthropologists in conversation with people from WHO, CDC, et cetera, to talk about how understandings of burial practices, gender relations on the ground, the household, would help um, these international organizations be better prepared and better responsive to the, the 
concerns of Ebola. Um, and increasingly, we, we're, I'm, I sit at one of these panels because I said you also need some historians. So it's becoming more than just anthropologists. But um, increasingly, I think one of the results of Ebola is the realization across the spectrum that we have to think about Ebola as, as a really a complex emergency that has many, many roots and many, many impacts, uh, both medical and beyond. Um, so at Emory, um, we, we do practice interdisciplinarity, and it is coming out also in the way that we are addressing Ebola. And so one of the, the um, funding sources that I know about is this big grant from the CDC um, to establish um, the African Center for Excellence for Public Health Security. And what's interesting about the group of people who are involved in that grant is it's um, out of the Rollins School of Public Health and the CDC, it includes um, people who are not uh, in the health sciences, including me, and it has close links with the Institute for Developing Nations that CETA heads. And it exemplifies exactly the kind of partnerships that Philip was talking about, which is in order to try and create sustainable um, public health care in these countries, um, Emory now knows that it really has to be more than just the health sciences, that it has to be about partnership with um, groups like the Carter Center that have expertise with IDN, um, and it has to be thought about as something that involves thinking about really complicated and difficult questions about sustainability, about how do you create health care in places where the resources really are not there, um, or not the kind of resources that you would see at Emory. So um, increasingly, I think we're seeing in the way that um, projects are being planned, a, a, complex, a realization of the complexity of what one's dealing with. And I'm very proud of, of Emory for leading in that effort. Um, and finally, I'd like to just end with some uh, a suggestion for how we might move this work forward. Um, I am um, head of the Center for Faculty Development and Excellence, and one of the things we have in CFT are university courses that are credit offering courses um, that are designed to bring faculty and students uh, from across different schools in the university uh, into conversation for a semester around particular topics. Um, and we've had ones on meth land, we've had ones on understanding violence, and I do think that one way forward might be to think about whether um, people involved in this uh, Ebola forum would be interested in doing a university course at some point, which would bring our expertise to bear for students in a credit-bearing way um, and could be repeated. Uh, so that would be my suggestion as we think about how, ways that we can um, enhance our curriculum in a, in, a, in a way that would also benefit the students in terms of giving credit. Um, and this would um, contribute to the kind of efforts already underway. So for example, Dabney Everts and Carlos Del Rio are running an Ebola uh, Coursera course that is bring, drawing on many, much of the expertise and hopefully reaching, and I think is reaching thousands of people. Um, but I think we need to think about ways that we can make this kind of conversation sustainable. Um, so I'd really like to thank the faculty who participated and the public who came, President Carter, who gave a really, really uh, great lecture last week, and to our colleagues at today's panel, and to Deb Brunner and Sita Ranjit Nelson for making this a really fabulous experience. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic from all of our speakers. Really appreciate it. Um, we can open this up to discussion. Let's have a conversation about where you would like to see um, this go from here, or if you have any questions for our speakers. Yes. Thank you so much for um, some really great perspectives, and I really appreciate that everyone um, was already planning to talk about the strength of interdisciplinary work, um, that I talked about it in the beginning, but I'm really happy that that was on everyone's docket because that, um, I can't stress that enough, that the, what I just came out of for the last two and a half months um, could not have done it without a really strong team of not only healthcare workers, but you know, logistics people and systems people and, you know, anthropology backgrounds. Um, and I really think that as a student and a graduate and now um, working in the field, I think that um, preparing us along the way from the beginning to work with people beyond our, our fields and our departments has to be the focus for, for what keeps going, whether it's in the context, because at this point, Ebola is, Ebola is over, but the hard part starts now. Um, and between my time starting in January when it was chaos and it was Ebola, and now in April it's 
still chaos, but it's everything else. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so, yeah, the hard work starts now, and so that's when we really need that kind of support. So I just wanted to say thanks for that. And then I had a question for um, Dr. Stevens as well. Um, I had several conversations with my colleagues over the last couple months about research and how, uh, what a shame it is that, you know, for us in the field that, that like there's still so much we don't know and so many lost opportunities to get really important information about, about the clinical course of the disease when it's happening at such a, a, a wide population level. Um, and there was also a really interesting article in the Times, I'm sure everyone read recently, about um, re Ebola research that had been done over the past several decades that never really made it um, into the hands of people who needed it. And so I'm wondering what, you know, your vision and your plan or, or what Emory can do to not only continue this amazing research, but make it efficient and make it open access and make it sure it gets into the hands of people who really need it, particularly our West African partners. First, thank you for your comments and, and for uh, your, your experiences and sharing your experiences with us. I think those were, were, were great. I think the research agenda that we've been putting together here is obviously part of a broader national research agenda, and more importantly, as you're suggesting, a, a broader international research agenda. I mean, as you as you point out, the, the issues are are really about uh, disparities in a in a very difficult to deliver care kind of setting. Uh, I, I will say the person sitting behind you has been in communication with colleagues in West Africa almost since uh, day one of the outbreak to kind of communicate some of the issues of clinical care and what we were learning, for example, about fluid and electrolytes and how those things could be uh, rapidly communicated to those particular colleagues. But I, and, and obviously, publication of, of materials on our website, uh, the publications that I've gotten out there have been, I, I think, helpful. But, but you know, the, the whole agenda of research as it relates to, to Sub-Saharan Africa in general, not just the countries affected by Ebola, but in general, are, are, are incredibly important. And I, and I think kind of the, uh, the discussion at the table is how can we partner with CDC, with the Carter Center, with others to help drive that research agenda forward. And, and I think uh, as an institution, though, we've made a commitment to, to develop uh, uh, a strong research agenda in Ebola, and that, that does need to be uh, uh, continually discussed with, with our, our, uh, our colleagues in, in, in West Africa. Other questions? Yes. I just want to back up on Emily's comment and on Dr. Stevens' comment. I think that we also need to make sure that we reach out to the existing institutions in Africa. For example, I know there's a network called the Piri Piri Universities that are trans-African looking at issues around logistics. Um, how can we make sure that we are not just doing research here, but how we in engage and support that research that's being, the questions that are be being asked at home, if you will. Hey, um, so I'm in the Master's in Development Practice Program and interdisciplinary engagement is a, is a cornerstone of that and I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. But one thing I've run into is how do you bring enough people to the table without taking the conversation, the content of it to such a surface level that everyone can understand it, um, that you're, you're not making much progress. So maybe, can anyone comment on how do you find that that sweet spot of like really being entrenched in good content, but being able to bring a lot of stakeholders to the table who wouldn't necessarily be together? Are, are you discussing this in terms of education or in terms of engaging with partners in West Africa? Thinking more about how do you do the, the rebuilding and the recovery? How do you look at rebuilding institutions and making them more effective and resilient in the face of future crises? Um, because I think that that's gonna want to bring together a lot of different knowledge bases so that things are well funded and they're sustainably funded moving forward. But how do you have the, the conversation be structured in such a way that um, there's an understanding of the, the complexities of, of either the medical or the financial um, issues involved, but it's, it's still it's tangible and understandable for everyone in the room? Well, I think Sita can probably address this, but I think that um, 
our partners are key to this, like the Carter Center. What we learned through a lot of the discussions is how absolutely invaluable it is to be engaged with those who are there on the ground and trust it right from the beginning. And I think they've had uh, very serious content conversations with these folks. Sita? Yes, what I would say um, in response to that is that when you can gather people of diverse backgrounds and diverse fields around a specific problem, the more specific you can make that problem, the easier it is to have a conversation that does all the bridging that needs to happen. So in our experience working with um, the Carter Center, I would say, um, and uh, uh, Pamela uh, worked with us on one of the first things we did, which was very focused on gender-based violence in Liberia. And our charge was quite specific to understand the root causes of gender-based violence and help identify some of the best practices that were out there in post-conflict contexts. Um, that started off as a working group, an interdisciplinary working group um, of people from, from the United States, from Emory, from Liberia, and it grew into a number of conferences that involved academics from all kinds of fields, professionals from different fields, uh, people from different places. Um, and what was so striking, uh, I remember at that time, was that everybody was working on an aspect of the problem but had not had an opportunity to work with each other. But I think part of the reason that we were, help, we were able to help orchestrate the conversations that allowed progress to happen in terms of uh, uh, new programmatic approaches to gender-based violence and other things was that it was a very specific problem that people were coming together around. And I think similar things have, have happened uh, in connection with work we've done on the theory and practice of uh, disease elimination and eradication. And also now we're just uh, underway with the Carter Center's democracy program looking at the issue of um, how to assess democratic elections. And again, uh, uh, scholars from different fields and election practitioners are coming together around a very specific problem. Um, and I'd like to speak to that. I think I do also want to acknowledge um, the challenge of what you talk, I mean, you are identifying a serious challenge um, and a complex one to answer. And I think one of the, the difficulties is that um, thinking interdisciplinarily uh, as one addresses problems on the ground in terms of sustainability, um, actually, as the Carter Center has shown, takes a lot of time. And that is in direct opposition <laughs> to funding structures which demand pretty quick results in order to get the more funding. And so one of the challenges is, I think, this, this almost this time lag between doing effective, sustainable, interdisciplinary work um, in country and elsewhere, um, and the pressures of funders who, who for their own reasons, I mean, they're also living in worlds of demands, need answers really, really quickly. And that, I think, is a really fundamental tension in doing international work and really is a, a, a really powerful challenge to overcome because the best will in the world cannot overcome that particular problem. It's, it's really difficult. <coughs> One comment, I, I recalled the work of Rudolf Virchow in the mid uh, 19th century, who went after he d went to investigate a typhus epidemic, I think at the age of 26, came back and recommended abolition of the church and complete and unfettered democracy. <laughs> and he said, without doing those things, they would never cure the typhus epidemic. And, and I, that, I really am glad that we have a diverse group of people here because when you start talking politics, and his, you know, his, his word, you know, politics is just medicine practiced on a, gr a grand scale. We have health disparities in this country that are politics driven. The health disparities around the world are largely politics driven. And we can do both great science and teamwork of care, but at the same time, we have to be very, very, I think, strident advocates for these kinds of issues and speaking up about them. And I think the university is, is, um, is gaining that, as Philip said. It, it comes from wherever it's coming from, it's a good place. Mm -hmm. 
and we've stepped up to the plate. And now we have, I think we have a very, very legitimate voice internationally in this to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. So, so in the, along those lines, I was thinking, um, Dr. Ailey, when you were talking about Susan Grant was the first nurse to address the medical students at the forum. Um, what opportunities are there in interprofessional education? I don't think we've maximized those around this topic, and it seems that um, while uh, Dr. Rivner's team has done that in hospital once graduated, there seems to be potential to lead. Well, I think there is potential to lead, I, and I think, again, this example set by the Ebola team is, to me, one of the best examples of team-based care that the world has ever seen, hands down. You know, we took a disease that people were fearful of, that many people around the world were probably not walking into because of their fear, and Emory turned it into a disease that could be treated. Mm -hmm. And they did it with, a really, I think, heroic efforts from caregivers. And I think that turned the tide. I mean, I know it turned the tide. I've, I've heard this sort of um, locally, politically, when people were upset that Emory was accepting patients, to going to, we can do this. So I think it's an incredible demonstration of the power of that. And of course we can do more of it. I, I was thinking about you know, the, the question about moving some of these things we do globally. I think the same thing needs to be done in healthcare in the United States. And we talk about team-based care and everybody's aiming toward that, but we need to rapidly disseminate some of these lessons learned and techniques to all of our care platforms. Um, we care for all sorts of people who are suffering and again, I think the demonstration of the success of what they did is a platform for care. And then that is the best demonstration to our learners. In addition to having, you know, maybe we need the, all the, the deans of the three health sciences schools to come over and talk to all of our students in the Woodruff Health Sciences Center building regularly. You know, what, what, even things like that on a, on a larger scale, I think are a big statement of that. Mm -hmm. We proved we can do it now, mm -hmm. so let's continue. Sounds good. <laughs> We're going to hold you to it. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Vince Farley. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer, served in three posts in West Africa, and I'm the Honorary Consul of Mali right now, so with that hat, maybe I have a certain perspective. Um, with all of the discussions you've had, all of the expertise you've developed, I hear of a committee of 24. Uh, I've been to four or five of the sessions you've had. It's been Ebola in West Africa, but almost all of the discussion has been on Liberia. Liberia, every country is unique, and Liberia is uniquely unique. Um, what I would encourage for the future, focusing on what are the lessons you are learning, and how can it apply in the rest of West Africa, particularly um, West Africa's maybe 300, 350 million people, Liberia is three to four million. And you had in Lagos and Port Harcourt, Ebola, eight cases. Eight, eight died, and I think it was 20 cases. A city of 21 million, million people. And that's a remarkable success story. What if it had landed in New York, uh, where they had eight cases and patients going out into the hinterland? Um, Mali had, uh, I believe, eight deaths, Senegal had one, and one of your speakers spoke historically of uh, DRC. Uh, Uganda's, I think, had five series of Ebola outbreaks. So what I'm really saying is the expertise you've developed, if you can translate it into how it works uh, in other countries, because it's a totally different base. Um, and I. I my only last comment would be, I've, I've seen the figure 1.3 billion uh, the United States government has put into Liberia. Um, now we're talking about real money. And I can assure you that one-tenth of one percent in other countries that you all, Emory has such expertise in, that would have gone a long way, I, School of Nursing. What could the nursing school do with one-tenth of one percent of 1.3 billion dollars working in, I believe, one of the speakers spoke, was at the School of Public Health, about the program Emory has been working with in, uh, it's the institute, I'm sorry, which institute was working in Senegal and working in Cote d'Ivoire. And they were talking about the partnerships. Um, so I, I just throw that on the table. You've developed 
such expertise, but if it can now be translated into a broader uh, experience, it would really help those who work on Africa and those Africans who work on these issues. I, that's a wonderful point. I think that, uh, well, nurses can do a lot with very little, but uh, that would, we would like that money. Um, but that aside, that aside, um, I, I think we tried to um, manage this in some, you know, um, we have the, our best relationship is in Liberia, so we, we tried to use that as an exemplar. But your point is extremely well taken, and that's what we hope that continuing conversations will do is broaden this. Um, and there's a great deal of context we need to learn, um, you know, religion again, back to how we started some of this conversation, um, the difference between Liberia with more of a Christian population and Sierra Leone with more of a Muslim population. Um, the issues of the context are extremely different in how we have partners and how we can get in and do some of the things we need to learn. But, and every country has its own uniqueness. Sita or um, Pamela? Um, I think that's actually a really good research question, um, and I could imagine uh, an article, you know, one, one thing we might think about is, is writing a kind of a, well, there'd be many authors, but a, a joint, you know, some sort of joint article arising out of the expertise of everybody, at least in the faculty forum, because the kind of questions you, you're asking, I think, are in part political economic questions. They also require knowing the colonial histories of these three countries and why America's interest in Liberia is not that interested in helping Sierra Leone, for example. Um, I think, it, uh, you know, e echo what Deb said, uh, it also uh, would requires to understand the state of medical care in places like Lagos versus uh, a, a, a city that emerging out of war like Monrovia. So I think and to understand exactly how medicine worked and, and the kind of healthcare that was delivered. So I think it's, uh, your question is, is fantastic because it actually, it, it shows the necessity of having all our different expertise put together to answer that question. Um, I do know that I've heard in one setting, someone fairly in the know said that, uh, that they thought that the reason that Lagos was so, um, was so good at managing to contain uh, Ebola was that the doctors were on strike and that there was also some ironies about the actual context of when that case arrived from Liberia that helped contain it. Um, there's also something about the her heroism of that particular doctor who, who stayed and tried to do things. So, but I, I think your, your question is excellent and points exactly to why we should, uh, we need all our expertise. And I think maybe we should think about trying to write an article that is, unites all those kind of different levels to, to help answer your question. But I, I wanna point out that there's still not been a word about Guinea. <coughs> and Guinea is, uh, people, it's not just because they speak French. It is a m far more complex, and no one's even begun to tease out why it has been so unsuccessful in terms of addressing. And that's for also, you know, people who are working there themselves cannot figure out why it, nothing is changing. And it's a very complex situation. Again, it's not simply just French because they're French speaking. really great sense of urgency right now in the field, particularly around the question of Guinea, because um, what there's hardly any information coming out, and the, you know, the reports that we get are extremely concerning. Um, and, you know, and e even in Sierra Leone, we're getting closer and closer and closer to zero, but the rainy season is going to be two weeks, and uh, there's still a lot of quests. So, I mean, I think the big picture question that you're asking is fantastic, but there's a huge sense of urgency um, to, to start asking those questions and getting answers um, quickly. So to ask those questions, Dr. Stevens, I was thinking about your um, discussion of opportunities for funding. Um, one of our speakers at the, during the forum showed us the graph of, um, that we, I think we, on the Ebola task force all saw of the Google hits and interest and how it peaked and how it's now troughing um, in, or hitting a trough in terms of interest. Um, can you look into your crystal ball and tell us what the funding opportunities are? Are they gonna be equally dropping off quickly or do you think that there will be a sustained opportunity given the impact of Ebola? 
Can I first talk, make a comment about the Sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, uh, I, I think you know, I, m one of my other worlds has been the meningitis vaccines in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I've been involved with the introduction of the serogroup A vaccine in, in that, that particular region, which was really quite interesting and challenging. And I, and I think that I would broaden your comment not just to talk about uh, West Africa and Guinea, but that entire region from Senegal all the way over to Ethiopia. And I think there's some real interesting challenges, some some similarities and some differences, obviously, across the, the spectrum that we could be involved in as a, as, as an as a as a institution uh, to help to partially address your question, I, I think the funding issue. I, I, obviously, there was a lot of interest uh, immediately when when uh, CNN had uh, 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 nonstop Ebola. Uh, after that, and there was. Uh, uh, obviously, interest on the part of the U.S. government to fund Ebola. A significant amount of money was made available in this fiscal year for Ebola work. Uh, historically, though, and it goes to a question you asked uh, earlier about sustainability of that funding. After 9-11, we saw an increase, and there was uh, money put into a lot of these uh, 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 communicable diseases, uh, bio threat agents, and that funding uh, actually went away. We had difficulty, Bruce has, got, has left, but we had difficulty funding the unit the last two or three years because of the very reasons that that, that funding stream had, uh, had gone away. And so the training programs that were put in place had, were in some jeopardy in terms of funding before this occurred. So I, I, think, I think there will be a, 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 a bolus of money. I, I, just given the issues, uh, whether that b uh, money goes away or not, specifically for Ebola, is, is a question. Uh, I do think that, the, uh, that we have gotten a, a jolt in the sense of, of as, a, as a nation that we need to be better prepared for some of these communicable disease efforts. And so hopefully that will result in a sustainable funding stream in the future uh, in obviously a very difficult funding time. Hi, I'm Sheila Cavett on English. I've got a question for Philip. Um, as you know, I've been at Emory for a long time. And one of the things that I've appreciated about this forum is that when people have talked about why things worked, they're talking about an institution and a place that I recognize. So I'm not sitting here going, wait a minute, what, 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 where, I mean, this is the values, I mean, Emory screws up a lot, we know, but the values and the cooperation and the interaction are things we have seen and they are structures that are in place. So from the perspective of the global planning that you're doing, are there specifics, you, why were we able to pull it off? I mean, what how are we doing right that we can continue to do right? Because I, I personally would agree with you that not every place could do this, that there are other places presumably who could have, but it was Emory and that that's not accidental that it was Emory, that it was pulling on values and resources and strengths and things we believe in that were already in place. So how can, can you put any more specificity on what those things are? You know, I, I don't know how much more specificity I can put on because in, in some, you could look at it and say, well, there was an Ebola epidemic and, and we happen to have the right set of resources and the right values. I mean, to give us credit, we, we, we were in the right place at the right time to be a, a, a leader in the response. It's very hard to predict what the next instance of that would be. Uh, you know, one of the things, as I was preparing for this panel, uh, I was really trying to reflect on what you're, you're asking. And I, I mean, I think what I, what I take away from it is that we've got to focus on areas of excellence here, on our partners, and stay true to our values. And, and that sa sounds kind of broad and, 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 and perhaps trite, but I, I think that's at the center of it. So, uh, you know, I think there's some specific things where, of course, we did get a lot of attention for Ebola, so there are specific areas coming out of this where we have much greater recognition than we had before. Uh, you know, pe people talk about the increase in 
undergraduate applications? Was this because we were out there in the media and people are interested in memory? And I, I, I think there's no answering that. So I think, I think some time has to elapse, um, but I think it's still kind of, a, uh, to my mind, it's still about developing core capabilities and, and tending to our, to our valuable relationships. And, and I would say that actually some of the things that sometimes, I love Emory and I love it because it is the place it is. I think sometimes I get a bit irritated because Emory is always aspirational. We don't just be. And I think, but I think there's something also, um, part of that aspirational tendency at Emory is also based on a kind of humility about not being, always being worried about whether we're good enough. And I actually think that humility in this case really came, was a good thing. Um, and the, uh, one of the other reasons I like being at Emory is I think by and large, we really are we, not perfect, but we do think about empathy. Empathy, we might not talk about empathy as one of our key values, but I think you know when we use words like engaged and things like that, empathy is behind that. And I think, so for me, something about the humility, the empathy, and, and indeed the strength in our health sciences um, all came together in a way that really made things work. It, it really was our best self, actually. Um, so I think if we can really try and answer that question, um, it's a good one. And not just aspirational, we were there. That's, <laughs> this, is the, this is the time, yes, yes. Dr. Downs, um, I, I challenged Dr. Elio on uh, interprofessional education, but in complex humanitarian um, emergencies, how mm. much interdisciplinary education do we have? Well, interestingly enough, that came out of um, our, there, there are a number of courses, you can get a certificate in it next door at the School of Public Health. We, I realized just the other day that if you come down to our end of campus, it's like all the schools down there are named for girls. There's Grace, <laughs> Claudia, and Nell. And we, and we try to work together, but we don't always. Um, we have, our complex humanitarian class was actually driven by the fact that our students were so interested and couldn't always get in the classes next door because it's such an interest in an interest. Our students have interests, school of public health students are interested, so we designed our own course for that particular topic. And it's specifically for nursing. Um, we love the opportunity to work with the folks next door or across the bridge, as we say. Um, and I think one of our better examples of that is in the migrant health program, where we work with physical therapy, pharmacy from UGA. And, and by the way, it's not physical therapy from Emory because our, our we don't ever align our um, schedules, so it's physical therapy from, UG from Georgia State, pharmacy from um, UGA, dental hygienists from across the area, so all of our students work side by side to care for patients who are in a disadvantage, if you want to put it that way. In South Georgia, it's pretty hot and there are a lot of mats, and, uh, but it's working with a migrant farm program, so we try to exemplify interdisciplinary practice in that way. Um, I think we should do it far more often. I would love to see more opportunity for things like more formal rounds, more um, real team, we have these team trainings that happen, but it's a once a year, once a semester blip in the schedule. It's, it's, it's almost an addition to rather than a part of, do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's not streamlined and I think we need to, it's a struggle to come up with more of that. Should I just oh, okay. okay, just like to say that I, I do think one uh, example at Emory that's also very good is the Global Health Institute's uh, fellowships for students, which depend upon having students from different schools. So I've been part of three, and they have involved you know, a student from the law school, two from uh, Rollins, uh, undergraduate in the college in one particular team, and something very similar in another. And I think that really, it, it trains the faculty mentors as two, because we're talking to faculty from different schools. Um, but I think that's a very, very good program that we should sustain. <clears throat> that one? Okay. Um, hearing your comments, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, reflecting more on Sarah's question also uh, made me think about the importance of having s some body or some unit hold that interdisciplinary space. Um, interdisciplinary academic programs hold that space. And I think when you get into the world of, of um, the intersection of scholarship and practice and applied work, you also need somebody who's responsible for holding that space. Um, I know that uh, I've become very interested um, lately in some of the work that's being done in the Collective Impact Forum, 
with the kind of taking the histories of community organizing with some of the approaches of, uh, to social innovation that are you know, coming out of um, uh, the California area and tech innovation and, and saying that you really need something like a backbone organization to, to keep all the partners at the table in conversation with one another, develop shared goals, shared metrics, things like that. So the seed for this um, forum was from the Commission on the Liberal Arts that Emory did um, from the recommendations from a year ago talking about um, these kind of cross interdisciplinary um, programs and um, taking advantage of things that are unique to Emory and having a interdisciplinary cross school discussion um, forum for projects and classes and courses and um, engagement of students uh, instead of just having a one-off kind of event and and then everybody goes away and doesn't talk about it anymore um, and while I think we knew I have a new associate dean to uh, for innovation to look at those kinds of um, issues from the Commission on the Liberal Arts it seemed to me that when we were writing those recommendations that they certainly apply not just to the liberal arts obviously the conversations here um, seem very pertinent and from the recommendations that were made from, from that commission. It would be interesting to continue that conversation and how we can broaden what was already recommended. Um, I think that they are acting on some of those recommendations, but I think that it builds on something already that we're working on instead of going off to do a new endeavor. Um, it seems to make sense to continue those conversations. So um, I, unless there are more, are there, oh. Debbie? I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on Elizabeth's comments, um, kind of speaking to the idea of the, the values and um, investing in our values over time. So the program that Elizabeth is speaking about in the nursing school, the Complex Humanitarian Emergencies, she mentioned the program in public health, and I just wanted to give a little bit of history of that, which is to say that over the past decade, that program has evolved, and again, it comes out of a partnership with CDC. So we have now a five-year cooperative agreement with CDC that's only in its second year, but actually this program has been developing for the past 10 years, which was the gradual development of these courses in complex humanitarian emergencies for public health students that are now kind of capped off by this cooperative agreement. And um, so that's just another example of the kind of importance of our partners for one thing, but also the investment in these other kinds of programs, which. Uh, you know, complex humanitarian emergencies, Ebola is one, but there are also many others, and we don't know what the next one will be. Um, so we have a system like that in place where we have a certificate program now for public health students. We also have a mid-career fellow. We also support practica for public health students in the field. And we're about to, and this is a great opportunity for collaboration, so there's a, a call for proposals out right now that we're planning to respond to, which is for professional education. So I think it speaks very much to um, this idea of ministers of health or other health professionals in the field to get this same kind of training in complex humanitarian emergencies. Not maybe Ebola specific, but how to respond in emergency situations. So there are definitely opportunities for that, I think. But also the challenge. I mean, I think that what you're saying, we just saw that, so there's this fabulous program. You, you've partnered with CDC, but there's not room for other schools to take the <laughs> class. We actually have, we have a collaborative agreement with them. We can place, we, we have spaces reserved, not reserved, we have, they've opened up additional spaces for uh. nurses. But in, the other partner in this could also be um, Georgia Tech, who has their complex humanitarian and logistics. And, you know, I know fully well that I can't really do a, a truly great job of nursing without the stuff that you need to have, whether it be as, be as beautiful as, you know, to clean patients or to wash patients or I IVs or needles, all that logistics that is so imperative that um, there's so much that we can learn from each other that, and I think having a center that would bring that forward and have a place for it, we're already doing it, we just don't really capture it. I mean, I think there are a lot of opportunities. I know there are a lot of our faculty that work at the medical school, our faculty that work with anthropology, various places. Um, I have wonderful, one of the connections I made here was with someone from journalism for one of our students who returned from, from Sierra Leone to do an article that is not going to appear in peer-reviewed journals. It's going to appear in the lay press for people to understand nursing differently and what it was like to work there. So, I, you know, these kind of opportunities can be very enriching. 
And uh, just like I say, uh, as part of this uh, anthropology forum that I'm part of, um, we're also hoping to make, because Emory has developed a tradition of public scholarship, um, is to have Emory help facilitate getting uh, the writings and voices of, of people, this is around Ebola, but it could be much more broad, um, who are working in these Ebola-affected countries, you know, healthcare workers, mental health workers, just family members, to, to get their voices into the op-ed pages of the international newspapers so that they also start shaping the conversation. And because Emory already has a history of working on op-eds and we've had some public scholarship opportunities, um, we've put together some uh, people who, who are willing to help sort of edit and help. And we have um, lists of you know people in the media who, who are willing to help. And the Anthropology Ebola Forum um, is, is very excited to try and leverage this. So we're working at the moment to try and make that happen. <coughs> So um, I, I think we're about to conclude. Are there any last questions? And if not, I think in summary, I wanna thank everyone on the panel. Um, and I wish everyone was here from all of the presenters from um, the whole semester. They've just, everyone's been fantastic and we're very grateful to our Liberian partners as examples. We see there, there's a great deal of future opportunity and we don't want to let this die. So this is on tape, anybody can, um, send your link to look at the link on the um, Institute of Developing Nations. All of the forum has been taped. Um, there's lots of opportunity to continue the conversation around um, interdisciplinary um, courses across the university. We can go to CDF, CF, CDFE. FDE, yes. We can go to Pamela, uh, Dr. <laughs> Scully, um, for um, further discussions with that. We can go to the IDN for further discussions um, about partnership opportunities. Um, we are going to be working on, um, as we said, the um, suggestion by um, uh, President Carter. So over the next year, I think it's going to take quite a bit of work. Um, we're probably going to be at least a year away, um, but it, it provides opportunities for engagement of so many that were involved in the forum, and we, and we hope to see that. So interest, um, we're looking for interest. Please um, uh, uh, contact um, uh, either the IDN or Dr. Scully or myself. And um, again, we're very grateful for all your participation and for all of the panel's participation, and we look forward to continuing, continuing um, Emory's leadership in, in this unique area. Thank you.